teeth is lighting up <laughs> our screens. I can't tell you how many stories of teeth we get to be really touched the cordial. One of my favourite ones, anonymous. After my elderly husband and I had a cuddle, I asked him to pass me a tissue. He handed me a tissue with his teeth wrapped in it. Uh. What a love bite that was. <laughs> Many more where those have come from. <laughs> now, in Academic Life, Saturday Live listener Eloise Sentito was concerned with literary theory and could tease out the dynamics of meta-narratives until the cows came home, until the idea of the different life she wasn't living became irresistible. She packed in her job and her small holding, bought a coach-built camper van and a fold-up loom, and now drives around Britain with her lurcher Murphy to make her living weaving gorgeous shawls and blankets and throws from native wools. She's in Plymouth today and joins us down the line. Morning, Eloise. Good morning. Was it a sort of Damascene moment, a kind of uh, a kind of flash of insight that made you change your life, or had it been coming on? Uh, wow, what a good question um, and a difficult question. I I suppose I feel like I've I've had contradictory. I've got contradictory sides of my personality, maybe um, a dual sign astrologically, uh, contradictory dreams in a way all my life, a sort of a big need for adventure and a big need for security and home. Um, and I think I'd been I'd been building quite a secure life that looked quite idyllic. Um, I'd had quite a lot of insecurity in my childhood and a lot of moving around, always in beautiful places and security in some form, sort of maybe emotional security, family love, but um, a lot of movement. And then I was very static for quite a long time, and yet I always had a sort of a bit of me knew that I should also be a bit of a gypsy. Um, you say a bit uh, of a gypsy, but it was a very dramatic change to your life. I mean, a thorough revision from top to bottom, and you took to the roads in a camper van. It was a very, well, I was going to say it was a very strange few years. Uh, I don't think it's over yet. Um, <laughs> the, the period of change, I suppose. It was a it was a gradual realization of how much wasn't working and I had to shed and shed and shed and I'm talking about relationships and attitudes and situations and circumstances and a job and a house and a horse and other material possessions Goldie talked about stuff. I was brought up to be very non-materialistic. I was living well below the breadline. I didn't feel like I was accumulating a lot of stuff, but I had a a beautiful rental home on Dartmoor. And as I say, a horse, I had chickens, I got a dog, a cat had kind of adopted me. I had four sheds, two bedrooms, a car, um, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't deal with any of it. I had a, a derelict vegetable garden. So I held all the stuff of my dreams in my hands and it was too heavy to walk with and I was yeah. getting sour. Um, I was getting, I was cross with everybody and resentful. I had hated being a tenant and I was sick of being an employee. Um, just by, all sorts of things <laughs> just by way of contrast describe what you live in now describe the stuff you have now so i majorly downsized and it was um it was partly because i didn't feel i had many other options um i live in an old motorhome an old Mercedes motorhome that's nearly 30 years old um, would have been quite classy in its day. Um, I lived up some very la narrow la lanes in on, on Dartmoor and I um, crunched it about four times in the second week of having it <laughs> after a very very careful first week and a <laughs> complacent cocky second week. Oh yeah, I can do this. Yeah, this Crunch. fits up these lanes. Yeah. So I live in I live in a motorhome. So it's a large vehicle. Um, but it's a pretty compact home with a big dog in it and a loom. So my weaving business is as small as it could possibly be and hopelessly inefficient for that reason. Um, but it is a fold up loom. So I ripped out the lounge of the motorhome and uh, put in my workbenches and wooden workbenches that I'd carved up, which were ex university furniture, actually, that I hadn't stolen. I was, <laughs> I think I paid for them you very modestly. Yes. You repurposed them. <laughs> But a great deal of I mean, I've been looking at some of the stuff you weave, and it is just exquisitely beautiful. Oh, thank you, Richard. And thank partly, you. I think, because it obviously belongs to a sort of locality, and I know you use native yes. wools, and when I look at them, I see the Largely. colours of Devonshire and Dartmoor kind of singing through. Thank you. Well, I'm a country lass. I'm very much a country lass. I've, I, um, I was born in Devon. Uh, and I've always lived on and around Dartmoor 
and I'm an only child, single working mother when I was a kid. I entertained myself a lot. We lived in beautiful rental properties, but she chose always very beautiful places. So I was in the woods, I was on the moor. That's um, sort of the land. I don't actually come from a farming background, although we've always been surrounded by farmers, but we. Um, my mother was quite bohemian and a craftsperson. But uh, yes, the land, the landscape, nature is sort of, you know, my escape and my god and my everything in a lot of ways. And tell me about weaving. Why, why weaving? Well, ironically, um, it was a very pragmatic, uh, consciously a very pragmatic choice in that as I was leaving the university I used to work at, um, I intended to turn and embrace a small holding life. So I was living on a small holding that had a lot of potential. Um, but small holding doesn't make any money. You have to own it outright or have, you know, have a partner with a good income or, 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 or something other than what I had, which was um, very little uh, in some ways. Um, materially, so... I, but I, but I was turning towards a weaving life. I had various ideas on how I, of how I might earn some money, and I thought, what craft? Because I've been brought up in the craft world, and I had a craft business before. I thought, what, what can I do that is quiet, autonomous, free, yeah. self-determining? That I maybe you know can have a product and that I sell, can sell and know how to sell, and will complement small holding. Perhaps I'll have some fleece <coughs> animals one day. You, you speak about a sort of tension between the desire for adventure and the desire for security, but it must have yeah. been a while before you were able to to turn weaving to sufficient profit to keep you alive i it was a it was a leap into the void it was a it was a leap of faith and i didn't do the maths beforehand because i knew the figures were not going to add up i knew it was <laughs> going great to business be plan there <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a business plan subsequently and it was really helpful <laughs> <laughs> i knew I, mean, I was brought up in this it doesn't it's not a good idea <laughs> if you want financial security it's not a good choice um uh, but I, I, I did know that in this um, still reasonably civilised country, I could claim housing benefit for a time. Um, I probably wasn't going to be homeless. I had some redundancy money. Uh, sometimes you just have to jump. Yeah. Uh, the magic, a car magic carpet can appear afterwards, and I, uh, one or two magic carpets did appear. But I also, wasn't counting on that, and it was amazing. But I imagine also not just magic carpets, but some things that might throw you. It must be lonely, <coughs> it must be sometimes quite vulnerable. Definitely both of those things, although, um, gosh, uh, loneliness can be most acute when you're surrounded by uh, others um, you know when you're in the mid midst of, of, of people and relationships that, that can be more lonely than solitude or, or strife I do um, sort of have quite a good internet community um, you have of course a lurcher and you're never alone with a lurcher I have a fantastic hound he's the gentlest kindest most loving wonderful dog and he makes friends left right and center there are, he has fans around the world but he has friends as well all around these aisles where I where I travel um, and he uh, he's a great conversation starter people fall in love with him and sometimes they sort of introduce us <laughs> or he introduces me and you know a stranger including someone i fell in love with last year um <laughs> so he, he's one he's, he's a wonderful asset everyone and he's very lurcher. soft <laughs> everyone needs a lurcher crikey uh, but i also know that he's he's got teeth he'll you know if, if something if it comes to it i've seen the edge of him it protecting always, me. he hasn't always. had to but he's Everything on this program is coming back to teeth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a very a kind of adventuring, uh, sort of gypsy-like existence, have you said. Is it now how yeah. you are going to live? Is it permanent? I don't know. I don't know. I doubt it. I doubt it. I, I've, I'm sort of thinking about settling down, and mm. yet I can't seem to make any decisions on that. Um, there are... I'm really enjoying two things. One is having endless possibility in front of me. And I don't need to realise any of it. It's just having the possibility is, is a wonderful way to live. A real kick. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing is... I'm enjoying being neither a tenant nor a landowner, and that's ideological for me. Um, 
Yeah, I do have a little bit of inheritance after my father died uh, in, in poverty actually last year in Italy. Uh, but, uh, he left me a little bit which would be enough for some land. Um, so I could settle to some kind of small holding life, possibly live in my van. I can't imagine giving up my van. Sounds like the van's great. The van is fantastic we and it says it's it's an old vehicle and it sailed through the MOT twice in succession, which I've never experienced in any other vehicle. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got a very good mechanic. Uh, okay. <laughs> Eloise, it's great talking to you. Thank you very much. We wish you okay, um, the very you. best. Keep weaving. Great. And uh, that's you. Eloise Santito. If you have a fascinating life story, if you've given up everything to weave in a van or whatever it might be, <laughs> if you have a lurcher in your life, text 84844, email saturdaylive at bbc.co.uk or you can tweet using the hashtag BBC Saturday Live. And this is Saturday Live with Richard Coles and Asma Mir with us this week of the musician and artist Goldie, Archer's actor Tim Bentink and model Mary Russell. And loads of you have been getting in touch about teeth. Um, just very quickly, this one from Pam. She has uh, several stories, but let's just pick um, one of them. I used to have two front teeth cemented in, but after a few years, they came loose. No matter how often my dentist re-cemented them, I was relying on Dentifix. I was a head teacher and one day I was bending over a child at lunchtime trying to help her use a knife and fork when they fell out into her mashed potato. <laughs> My teeth dramas were a constant source of laughter at school, I bet they were. A lot of nurses have got in touch and spoke with some affection tinged with horror at the old days of going around and collecting patients' dentures on the ward and keeping them yeah. in a bowl full of steridant and then trying to match patient to denture oh, when right. the need arose. Lots with varying of varying degrees of success. <laughs> nice one here from Mary who says, I nursed a patient who'd suddenly stopped talking and eating. We thought she'd had a stroke because her face was all lopsided actually she'd taken other patients teeth and had three pairs rammed into her mouth it took ages to get them out oh 